Aesthetics are very important, especially little things like that. It's particularly pointed because you had F.P. Jorn's immediate input. But a lot of times, you know, aesthetics can be subjective to the point that people get confused. Yeah. Your co-claim to fame, obviously, besides men's sartorial excellence, is the wrist size survey. <laughs> uh, and, and I have to ask you, because you've had watches of all different size and broadly surveyed collectors, Tell me where this started and how you recommend people judge when a watch is just too darn big, because that seems to be what's at the heart of it. Okay, so it started because I was very sick of hearing people argue about what was the right size of watch, because they would always be argued in quite an inconsiderate way, right? It'd be like, why do you need a watch that size? This is the right size, right? And it's like, you don't live my life. You don't know what's right or wrong for me. Um, but I didn't want to just be another guy banging on with my own opinion. I wanted to actually collect some data and do something that might actually be of use and of interest to a lot of other people. So that was one of the starting points. And the other one was, you know, in the shop, when we chat with customers, watches are something that always comes up, just because it's fun to talk about watches. And it's a nice shared interest that you can um, speak about with a lot of different people who come through my shop. Uh, and overwhelmingly, I would hear the phrase, I have really small wrists, I have really small wrists. Right. So that was like a big part of the survey, was just like the perception of like people's perception of their wrists, which could not possibly be like, like it's not possible for 75% of the male population to have small wrists, right? That's just, yeah, If they all say right. my wrist is below average, average is lower than we think it is. Exactly. And, you know, funnily enough, like nobody, it's not like you have a an, an enormous number of people saying, oh, I'm below average height, right? This somehow only happens in wrist size. So this, because of this, it must be being modified by some other external factor. We're talking about wrist size and the wrist size survey, and I guess there are aesthetic standards, rubrics that we use to judge when a watch is too big on someone's wrist. Uh, help our audience out. When do you think a watch is just too big for the wrist? If the lugs go past the bone, I think that's too big. Like for me, I prefer it to be well before going past the bone. Um, that's one thing. Um, I think that you have to try to be conscious of the shape of your wrist. So, you know, whether it's a, an oval or whether it's a cylinder, um, you know, because that obviously affects the way the lugs yes. are going to hang off your wrist. I think actually the size of your hand makes a big difference too. Like even if you have a small wrist, if you have a big hand, you, you don't, you kind of want to have the watch more proportional to your hand necessarily than to your wrist as well. Um, but in terms of like the, the design of the case, uh, like for instance, I used to think I could only do 38 millimeters at most. And really the majority of my collection would be 34 to 36. But then I realized actually 38, 40, even 42, like in the case of that Okta, um, if it's thin, I don't mind it so much. Now there are a couple of, I guess, standards I use, and, and one of them is thickness, because I found, I found that there's some watches that are actually not that big, but when, you know, you have a, for example, 39 millimeter Planet Ocean, and it's 16 millimeters thick, mm. it, it's just like a hockey puck on your wrist, even if it's not objectively that big. Yeah. Do you feel that same way about aspect ratio? The watch needs to be as broad as it is thick, or at least have a handsome aesthetic relationship between the two? I think it does, and it, it depends from size to size too, right? Like even looking at what we have on the table here, like this Omega is tiny, I think that's 32 millimeters, but it's so thick, so it, it wears much bigger than it really is. And it, it feels like comfortably substantial, like aesthetically it, it, it's coherent, it works. This Patek, the 3923, actually I don't find this as nice as it could be, because in this case it's both a little too small and a little too thin. Like if you think about, for instance, the Patek 96, right? Yes. Which is actually quite an angular, thick case considering the size, that looks great. You know, like this case should actually be a little bit more like that case. Now I also have a question because it seems like there is a, a crossroads between attire and watches and the watch is always more on the accessory side, but a pocket watch is very intimate. It's, it's inboard of your ensemble. Mm. Because you do do tailored clothing and you do work with high-end men's fashion, do you have any insight into why pocket watches never seem to be poised for a comeback? There are some things that are just 
kind of too dorky. <laughs> you heard it here first. Like, so like when I started the army, right? Like it was really, I was already very conscious that we are selling a style of clothing that in, in many people's eyes is going to die out, right? So you got to do whatever you can do to keep this thing relevant. Because like, I really love this style of clothing. I really love neckties. I own a freaking necktie company, okay? And I really just bought it because I love neckties that much. Like, you have to do what you can do to keep people interested. You can't just expect that like, they'll fall back into those old ways for the sake of tradition or because you think it's right, right? I do love pocket watches. Like I own a few pocket watches because I think they're just beautiful things. Um, in fact, I, have you ever, did you watch the last Roger Smith lecture in London? No, I haven't caught that one yet. It was, it was really good. Uh, and I was actually kind of surprised at his attitude. Like his attitude was very, and I don't know if he was just playing to the audience, but it was very like, we used to make all these timepieces using steel. Why do we need any of these modern materials, right? Like we perfected this, let's just keep going, or not perfected, but we like, we're on the right track, right? Like there's still mileage in this type of, uh, this philosophy of design of keeping things very basic. So let's keep going with that. And that's also kind of why I like pocket watches, right? Like it's a, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful throwback to that attitude, like that style of working. Plus, you know, as a person who enjoys fonts and graphic design, like a lot of those pocket watches, because they're so big, you could do so many beautiful things with just the placement of the elements on the dial too. That's a good point. I mean, we could, Boston Dynamics, we could build a robot horse that could win the Kentucky Derby, <laughs> but I think the romance is in the thoroughbred all the same. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the diversity in your collection because you clearly have no dogmas. You have the Grand Seiko VFA alongside the Vacheron 4072. Is there a common thread that unites the two or is it just a matter of them appealing to you in different ways? Different ways. Um, Grand Seiko is always something that's been quite close to my heart, I guess. Um, you know, as like a, as an underdog myself, right? Like I, I appreciated that they were the underdogs. Like 1960, as Japan was gaining strength as an industrial power, as a manufacturer, they f really, really wanted to make something that could compete with the Swiss. Like they were literally staking their national pride on making this thing. And um, whether they, you know, equaled the Swiss or not, that's up for debate. Um, personally, I do think it's a beautiful watch. And I respect that attitude, you know? I think that's amazing. And I think that that's one of the really interesting things about the culture at Grand Seiko. Because after, for instance, the, um, I can't remember the reference to this. I always call it the Grand Seiko first or the 3180, but that's actually yeah, that's the 14070, is it? I, I want to say that it's mostly just called the 3180 after the movement that was inside the watch. I always call it 3180. Let's call it 3180. Yeah. So, I mean, the 3180, and there's the VFA, where they were like, let's make a movement that's even better than everyone else's, right? and they just kept grinding, right? They just iterated and tried this and that and that, and you know, eventually they reached close to the pinnacle. Like th this VFA is also at Seiko's museum in Tokyo. If you're ever in Tokyo and you get a chance, that's an awesome museum. It's really worth seeing, not just for the, the Seiko pieces, but also because they have like a section on the history of timekeeping in Japan. Because Japan, Japan, like we take the 24 hour system for granted, but actually, um, Timekeeping in Japan was under, a diff under their own domestic system where they would take a day, split it into day and night, and then split the day and night into intervals. And the intervals were uh, controlled imperially and also varied from region to region. So for instance, Tokyo would have different intervals than Osaka on the other side of the country. And they, you know, runners would travel the country to update people's timekeeping. Cool, huh? It is, and it's, it's interesting because it's so alien to the Western sensibility of how time is kept. Mm. And it seems non-linear, it seems yes. very local. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you mentioned that the vernacular of, of watchmaking in Japan started with a desire to emulate Switzerland, match it, and ultimately an ambition to surpass it. So it is fascinating, between the two vintage pieces in your collection, you could see how early on Grand Seiko was looking to 
communicate with that vernacular gleaned from Europe. Mm. But by the time the VFA was coined, we have an entirely different sensibility about the angularity of the mm. polyhedron case, yeah. the height of the indices, the mirrored inner bezel, as well as the movement itself, yeah. a watch that was more comfortable perhaps being uniquely Japanese rather than emulating a European mode. And you know, because this just occurred to me, it is Japanese Day of the Week, which I sort of wondered, did other countries do that? Were there bilingual day of the week wheels? You know, I've seen bilingual day date watches with the day being bilingual, and I know Rolex has made a million different versions of the day date with so local it'd be, languages. So it would be a wheel with seven, with 14 different markets. Because it is not a standard day date seven day. You know, it's not simply translating English to Japanese. I would assume that it's been done with the day date, but I don't know for a fact whether the dozens of different languages used on the day date were ever non-standard weeks. Interesting. Because in this one, right, it's Monday to Sunday in Japanese, but you can switch it to just Mon Tu Wen Thur Fry as well. Um, basically, you switch it on the, um, at a different position, and it will just skip over the, the intermediate one. So if you set it to Japanese, it'll skip over the you know English what? to I go think, to the Japanese I think one. I've definitely seen Zen day dates do it. I'm almost 100% certain That's I've cool. seen it with Zen. I, I'm pretty sure I've done that. And I think it's, it's built on like an ETA 2893 or 2836 base, where instead of having a GMT, they, they just wind up using that second driver for the, for the date and the huh. 14 slots. That's cool. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. But it's interesting because we went from European vintage with the Vacheron to Grand Seiko in Japan. And I mean, we have everything in between, including a little bit of East meets West. Tell us a little bit about the Tato Ando. Octo Finissimo and how you were drawn to that. This is another one of those you got to own it to really understand it sort of things. I'd seen the original release of the Octo and I thought, oh, it's pretty interesting. But then the Bulgari logo was a little too strong for me. It was a little too in your face. And then this came out and, you know, it's just concentric circles. There's no Bulgari marking on it at all. And I was like, oh, wow, it's really cool. And I happened to be in Tokyo the next week and actually a friend of mine recently started working in Bulgaria, so he set one aside for me. You know what's interesting about this watch, actually, is that, firstly, it matches nothing I wear, okay? Like, I've, I, I'm not known for wearing what looks like a Star Trek prop, but you know, once you have it on, you don't feel it. So whereas, visually, it's quite loud, because you never actually have any sensation of it, because it's so light and so thin, it, it, it's quite surreal wearing it. I do know exactly what you mean. It's almost a second skin watch. It's only yeah. five millimeters That's thick. That's the way to put it, yeah. It's titanium, it's big, broad, flat. It, it's fascinating yeah. because the watch is so much broader than it is thick. I mean, I like to say it's the kind of watch that sits below the wrist hair even. Yeah, that's a great way, that's a great way to put it. Uh, a little bit inartful on my part, but uh, <laughs> you have a lot of interesting dials and uh, from the custom that you conceived yourself to Scottish enamel to Japanese precision to, well, what can only be described as a highly non-standard Nautilus. What is the story behind this 3800? Because I saw it and I thought, what the hell is that? I know, I get that a lot. And it's quite polarizing too. Some people think it's horrible. A zero index flat sunburst slate 3800 from the factory though. Yeah, and with Dauphin hands as well. And you mentioned this is documented. Yeah, I have the receipt <laughs> for the dial. What's sad is I don't have the original dial. No, I mean, you've got a watch that's effectively a piece unique. If there's another one out there, I haven't seen it. I don't know how much that watch is worth now, but I got that for like 14 grand. And it's like, I don't think, no, 12 maybe? Like, I don't know where you're going to find a Nautilus for that sort of money anymore. But it makes me a little uncomfortable wearing it now because people see it as an expensive watch. Whereas back when I bought it, it was this like goofy little thing that no one really knew about. Well, so oftentimes when things fall out of my collection, it's because they've kind of gone into that realm instead. Oh, I can definitely see that. Uh, it's, it's a different watch than it was when you bought it, just because the way pop culture has sort of turned as the watch has stayed stationary. Mm. Sometimes you stand still and the world revolves. And Indeed. with the Nautilus, that's kind of been the case. Yeah. Um, now, planning for the future, uh, what are your, your future, I guess, grail watches? Do you have such a thing as a grail watch in mind? Um, no, I don't. There's like watches I'm kind of interested in owning, but I've realized that just there will never be an end game watch for me. Like this will always be cycling in and out. There's certain pieces that are much stickier because of 
the kind of personal and emotional associations that are attached to them. Um, but, you know, I'm not like looking for anything in particular. Something I have been getting into a little bit more recently is um, like very small independence. Um, so like Anno Dane, for instance, is quite a small independent. Obviously, Jordan's independent. Um, this one here, the Naoya Hida watch, like I kind of bought the, I, like I saw it on SJX site again. Congrats to his taste. I mean, uh, kudos to his taste. And I was like, oh man, that thing's awesome. I got to go see it. So another time I was in Tokyo, I arranged a meeting and he was a great guy. He was so interesting and so knowledgeable and so passionate about what he wanted to do. And it really comes out in the watch. Like the watch is really neoclassical. You know, it really like comes from a classical approach to how watches should be designed and how they should look. And then takes it a little bit further using modern techniques. So like, for instance, the case is not made by a traditional case maker. It's made by a precision engineering company that normally does auto parts and computer parts, you know? But then like, there's also that, that very fine wabi-sabi Japanese sense of handwork. Like the dial, which is a silver dial, it's a German silver dial, it's hand engraved and then it's lacquer filled. And every engraved dial is a little different from the next too, depending on like how the engraver feels, um, who's the customer who might end up owning it. You know, so I actually had two of these in my hands because I introduced this to one of my customers and he really liked it. And so I helped him grab his at the same time and putting mine and his side by side, like the numerals were very different. Mine have a little bit more of a serif curl to them. They're a little bit deeper and a little bit bolder. Whereas my client's one is finer and more refined. So it looks more like a dress watch, whereas this one looks more like a sport watch. And all this coming from just like, not even millimeters, like fractions of millimeters in the font on the dial. That's when you really get a sense of it. And you know, that's like a lot of what my business is about, right? Like I deal with like quite esoteric, single or like small team of three type craftsmen yes. making incredible things that are often like unrepeatable. Like once they've made one, the next one is not going to be a photocopy of the last one because that one took on a life of its own as it was being made. And I suppose that is part of the fun. We talk about the thrill of the chase, including in the creative process, all the better when it's bespoke. So do you think that's a direction that the, the industry, at least at the top of the collector hobby, is ultimately going to take a move towards independence and away from groups? Because I think one has become almost a commodity while the independence Granted, they're limited by volume, but we were talking about Hajime Asaoka and the Corono and how he could take his design vision, at least, and make that more prolific. Mm. Um, you know, so is it... Yeah, it, like it can kind of cross-pollinate in both directions. Exactly. You, you can have one man's undivided vision, yeah. albeit mass-produced, but then you can also have the bespoke. So uh, I'm going to draw some parallels to what I do, right? Yes. Like, there was a time when everyone was like, oh, a ready-to-wear suit is fine. If I want a really fancy one, I'll get a Kiton, I'll get a Natalini. It'll be a ready-to-wear, but it's beautifully made, it's fine, right? And those are very fine suits, they're very handmade, but they're not the same as bespoke, right? Because bespoke means that it's just one for this person. And piece unique in watch terms. It's piece unique. And I think if you're at the very top end of stuff, of anything, right? you're always going to be interested in that piece unique. But I think that you, there's a lot of people who are like, who think they want to go in that direction, but they also don't realize the downsides of bespoke, of piece uniques, which is if you're only going to get it from one person, you're also subject to the quirks of that one person, right? So if your, say, bespoke watchmaker decides that he's going to just be really flaky and not get back to you for months, you don't really have any recourse. Like you just ha kind of have to live with it. And so it, turns from being like some sort of commercial company to customer relationship to something more like an artist and his patron a sort of relationship. Yes, exactly. Which I think is fun. I enjoy it. But um, there are definitely people who don't enjoy it. And in many ways, that's kind of part of the work of the Armory is we act as like the go-between between, between these potentially very gifted, but potentially like difficult to deal with craftsmen and a very demanding customer. I can see that. Yeah. You're sort of, you're, in so, some ways, you're sort of the medium between the pure artist and the consumer side yeah. to maybe provide a buffer when the creative process becomes a little too intense. Yeah. It's kind of like having a negotiator 
in like a professional nego negotiator in between two parties, right? Yeah, but let me let me ask you a question for uh, folks out there who don't know who you are, who've never heard of the army, who've never heard of Drake's, don't know about your social media. How can they find you on the web? Because I think that's the tie that binds us all. I actually kind of like the way. I, I would actually suggest if you were really interested in seeing what we do, just follow my Instagram, because then you get a little bit more insight. Like, you know, we Mark Cho on Instagram. Yeah, Mar uh, MarkCho.com. Mark People Cho. in high school used to call me MarkCho.com, so I use those names right now. Like, because you know, as a company, you are expected to put things out in quite a polished way, whereas for me, like, it's quite casual. You know, I enjoy showing people all the dirty nuts and bolts, like, underneath the facade. Like, because I like craft, and I like fine things, and I, I like human effort. And with human effort, you're always going to have that, like, kind of grit underneath the shininess. When people see someone is comfortable with themselves, it makes them comfortable too, right? There's something that, that resonates between people when they can observe that and be near that. And you know what, that's, that's just, I guess, the common thread uh, that, that binds us. Otherwise, this would just be a matter of purchases. Instead, I, I think we'd like to think that the watch hobby at its best is an evolving experience rather than just a purchase with a beginning and an end. Mm, absolutely. Mark, thank you so much. My pleasure. Time out, Tim out, Mark out. Thanks for logging on. Mm -hmm.